Okay, hopefully, yep, that sounds like the microphone's on. Okay, so I'm Phil Blomson. I'm going to introduce our uh, speaker for the stretchy lecture this term. Um, firstly, I'd like to say a big thank you to uh, Oxford Asset Management, our sponsor, who makes this series of lectures possible. I've also been asked to draw your attention to our hashtag. They're prominently placed in case you would like to tweet. Um, and also, anyone interested in our software engineering program can uh, find brochures outside and people to talk to. Um, so, okay, but on to the main uh, business. So it's my pleasure to introduce Zubin Garamani, who will give our Hillary term uh, stretchy lecture. Uh, Zubin um, is a uh, professor of information engineering at Cambridge. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, I think it's fair to say that his machine learning group in uh, Cambridge is, um, uh, would be one of the most influential over the last decade. It's hard to, it's hard to go any, to any major machine learning academic group or industry lab without finding Zubin's ex-students or postdocs. Um, so, uh, and more recently, uh, Zubin founded Geometric Intelligence, a startup, um, and after its acquisition, uh, he's now the co-director of Uber AI Labs, and maybe if you ask nicely, he might tell you a bit about that. Um, we'll see. Uh, okay, so Zubin's made contributions across uh, machine learning, um, uh, particularly probabilistic inference, uh, even deep learning. Uh, it's not surprising, he was um, Mike Jordan's student and uh, did his postdoctoral work with Jeff Hinton, so a pretty amazing uh, pedigree there. So uh, really, Zubin's seminal work is really in Bayesian nonparametrics, uh, where he's really been um, leading this idea that it's not just enough in our machine learning research to aim for, for accurate predictions, we also need to be able to quantify uncertainty, we need to be able to talk about causation. Uh, and if we really want machine learning and AI to have an impact in industry, we need to be able to tackle those things. I'm sure he'll tell you all about uh, these things, so please welcome Zubin uh, for the talk. Uh, thanks, Phil, for that great introduction, and uh, a great thank you to uh, the Department of Computer Science for inviting me. Okay, can you all hear me? Yeah, good. So I'm going to talk about probabilistic machine learning, which is my passion. It's the thing I'm really excited about. And uh, I'll start from basics. And as the talk goes on, we'll get into more and more um, current research, more of what we're actually really doing uh, these days. So that's why the subtitle is Foundations and Frontiers. Foundations is meant to be you know, uh, motivation, background material. Uh, but if you're bored by that, don't worry, it'll get uh, more uh, technical later on. OK, so uh, let's start from the basics. Uh, machine learning, well, what is machine learning? It's just a term. And there are many other related terms. Um, you know, Depending on the community that you come from, you might think about data mining or artificial intelligence or statistical modeling, neural networks, pattern recognition, sort of a bit of a more old-fashioned term. All these terms are related. Um, I'll focus on the term machine learning, uh, but keep the context in mind. Um, in terms of academic disciplines, this is also a very interdisciplinary area in that we draw from ideas in computer science, engineering, statistics, applied mathematics, and we get a lot of inspiration from uh, cognitive science, economics, even tools from physics and neuroscience. And then, uh, why are people interested in machine learning these days? Well, it used to be kind of an interesting academic field where you sort of played around and you kind of tried to get computers to learn from data. Most people didn't care much about it. But now, suddenly, lots of people care. And the reason lots of people care is because there are many, many applications of machine learning. It's sort of, I like to think of it as, the invisible thing that's behind a lot of the more visible applications um, that involve computers learning from data. Um, so let's just go through some of those applications just to motivate. Um, uh, speech and language technologies is an area that has been transformed by the use of machine learning. So uh, automatic speech recognition, machine translation, question answering, dialogue systems, and every year we seem to get more and more advances in these um, sorts of tools. Computer vision, again, a field that has been around for a very long time. 
but with the advent of large amounts of data and uh, more uh, powerful computational tools, we're able to now do interesting things like uh, not just object face and handwriting recognition, but image captioning, going from an image to a bit of text that's uh, meant to describe the image. And these are, um, this is from a, a very famous paper. Um, and you, know, you can actually pick it apart in the sense that you could say, well, these are hand chosen to make the algorithm look good. You know, man in black shirt is playing guitar. That seems pretty amazing that a computer could take an image like this and produce this description of the image. Um, it doesn't always work that brilliantly, but I would say that most of us in the field were stunned when we saw this um, happen for the first time, that uh, we could actually get a system that would produce some reasonable descriptions from images. Um, of course, we all have cameras in our pockets that put boxes around people's faces. If you ever ask yourself, well, how does that work? Well, that's a bit of machine learning that runs on um, all of your camera devices. Um, uh, moving into the sciences, a lot of the sciences have become uh, very data heavy. Um, Fields like uh, bioinformatics and genomics and the medical sciences, but also astronomy, uh, areas where we're now able to collect uh, much more data than any human being could sit down and analyze uh, manually. And so um, machine learning and AI tools have been uh, very important in scientific data analysis. And that's something I'll talk about maybe a little bit later on as well. Recommender systems, we all know what these are, you know, customers who bought this item also bought this kind of thing that's driven by machine learning. Um, Self-driving cars, something that I'm now uh, much more involved in. Um, this is not a totally new thing. I mean, uh, this self-driving car, Alvin, was around about 30 years ago and he used neural networks to drive around at uh, 70 miles per hour on highways. That's what it says on this slide that I took from about 30 years ago. That's very scary. I would not want to be anywhere close to that truck driving at 70 miles an hour on a highway driven by a neural network that's about this big. Um, but things have moved on, and uh, we now have uh, pretty good self-driving systems that are just getting better, better every year. Um, robotics, I just love dogs playing football. Um, so robotics is, this, this particular sort of RoboCup isn't necessarily driven by machine learning, but there is a lot of uh, excellent uses of machine learning in robotics. Uh, automated trading, financial prediction, computer games, you're all familiar with, um, you know, the, the DeepMind uh, landmark results first with uh, learning Atari games, um, playing Atari games at uh, human or superhuman level. Uh, then more recently um, beating the world master at Go. And who knows what this is? This is uh, Libratus, uh, a system that um, recently uh, won a poker championship. Um, and this was very against a whole bunch of humans. This is all the numbers in parentheses are how much money the humans lost to the computer. Um, and the very interesting thing about this is that this is quite a uh, complicated game in that if you think about poker, what does it involve? Well, it involves things like trying to understand um, the state of mind of the other player um, and uh, bluffing and things like that. So to be a good poker player, you have to be able to do those things. And so now we have good machine poker players as well. So what is it? Well, machine learning, if, if, um, if I had to define it, I would use a, a sentence like this. It's an interdisciplinary field that develops both the mathematical foundations and practical applications of systems that learn from data. And here are some of the main conferences and so on associated with that field. Um, so uh, that's all in terms of motivation for um, applications. But actually, when you look at machine learning systems, most of the time, machine learning systems are, are trying to solve one of a few canonical problems. So I'll just go through those canonical problems in my kind of introductory part of the, of the lecture. 
So this is probably the most canonical problem, the classification problem. You have some data, you want to classify it into two or more classes. Um, so the task is to predict some discrete class labels from input data that has lots and lots of applications. And there are a lot of buzzwords for different methods that can be used for classification. These are just different ways of trying to do classification from data. Uh, regression, trying to predict some continuous quantity y from some inputs x. Uh, obviously, this has lots of applications as well. And um, you know, there are lots of methods, some of which you might you know, say, well, that's not a machine learning method. That's linear regression. It's been around for over 100 years. But you know, again, remember, this is all in the context of everything that's been going on in all of these neighboring fields. And there's nothing that says, oh, this is a machine learning method, and that's not a machine learning method. If it's just if it's making predictions and decisions from data, it is a machine learning method at some level. Um, clustering, the task here is to group data together so that similar points are uh, put in the same group. Uh, many applications, again, many different methods. Dimensionality reduction, when you have very high dimensional data, you might want to find a low dimensional representation of that data that preserves important information. Uh, another canonical machine learning problem. Uh, Semi-supervised learning, um, where you might have uh, some labeled data, here you might have a few labeled points, like these two uh, labeled points that are minuses and these three that are pluses, and you might want to basically be able to leverage the fact that you have a lot of unlabeled data as well. And so semi-supervised learning combines labeled and unlabeled data to get better predictions. And reinforcement learning, which is related to um, sequential decision making and adaptive control, the task there is to learn to interact with an environment making sequential decisions so as to maximize future rewards. So it's an interactive setting where you have an agent producing some actions or decisions in an environment. There might be some hidden state to both the agent and the environment. And then uh, you get some uh, observed sensory inputs and the agent has to, be, um, has to act in the environment to maximize its rewards. Okay, so these are the canonical problems. It, it is actually quite bewildering if you start reading the machine learning literature and you're not an expert because there are many, many different methods and uh, you know, every paper seems to pre um, present a new method. And so here is just sort of a, a very crude way of organizing a bunch of machine learning methods, but don't give this too much, um, don't put too much weight on this. Okay, but I'm gonna focus on uh, for the first few minutes, I'm going to focus on one bubble here, which is this neural networks and deep learning one. And the reason I'm focusing on that should be, um, for any of you who's familiar with the field, it should be pretty obvious, because these methods have been really revolutionary. They've really um, been involved in some of the most spectacular breakthroughs in the last few years. So what are they? Well, a neural network uh, and I'm going to focus here on a feed-forward neural network, just for simplicity, there are other kinds, but a feed-forward neural network, the most standard one, is essentially just a function approximator. So it takes uh, some inputs, call them x, and it produces some outputs, call them y, and the way it produces them is through uh, a sequence of transformations organized in layers, but all of that is, in a sense, a bit of a detail. It's just a way of representing a function that maps from x to y via tunable parameters uh, called weights, or I'm using theta to, to note, note the, denote the parameters of the network. Um, so neural nets are, I mean, one of the important aspects of neural nets is that they're nonlinear functions, and they're often both nonlinear in the input and nonlinear in the parameters. So optimizing them to minimize some objective function tends to be uh, slightly complicated. And the other defining characteristic of neural networks is that uh, they represent the function from x to y in layers, which is essentially simply just as a composition of functions. Okay. So here is 
a multi-layer neural network with one hidden layer represented as a function that maps from x's to y's through some parameters. And these superscripts here, one and two, denote the, the two layers of parameters that you have. And these neural networks are usually trained to maximize some likelihood, so they fall very squarely within the world of uh, statistical models um, using some variant of stochastic gradient descent optimization. So this is where we start using tools from optimization theory. Okay, so that's one slide on neural networks. And these things have been around for many decades. Um, in fact, these things are what got me excited about AI uh, back in the 80s when I was sort of an undergraduate and, and thinking about what to do with my life. Um, but what's happened is that uh, something dramatic has happened between the 1980s uh, and now. And one of the things that's dramatic is that the, the terminology has changed. So people now call these uh, deep learning systems because they have many more layers. But there are other more interesting dramatic things that have happened. So these deep learning systems that um, are involved in a lot of these uh, very impressive benchmarks are... Uh, very similar to the neural net architectures from the 80s and 90s with some important architectural and algorithmic innovations like being able to use many layers and particular nonlinearities such as the ReLU, particular ways of regularizing them like dropout and um, very useful tricks for dealing with time series like LSTMs. Um, they are also based on vastly, they're trained using vastly larger data sets, really web scale data sets. Um, to do that, you need vastly larger compute resources, so GPUs, GPUs on clouds, etc. Importantly, there's been a major effort to democratize the software tools so that it's quite easy to actually train a neural network, so we have much better software tools, uh, things like uh, Torch and TensorFlow, and of course there has been vastly increased industry investment and media hype. And what that, has, what that has meant is that there is a huge influx of people trying out different variations of neural networks on different problems. And stepping back, I kind of think of this a little bit of, uh, as um, the community of machine learning researchers is running a bit of a genetic algorithm trying out lots of different ideas and variations on ideas to um, be able to improve on the performance of existing benchmarks. Okay, so that's, uh, that's deep learning in a, in a nutshell. There's huge amounts more to say about that, and there are many better people than me to talk about that. But one thing I do want to talk about is limitations of deep learning. So let's step back from the excitement, let's acknowledge the excitement, and let's say, well, where do we go next? What do we need to focus on? And I would argue that there are a few limitations we really need to think about. So one of them is that uh, neural nets are very data hungry. You often need millions of examples to train these large models, and that should not be surprising if you, uh, if you know um, a bit of statistics. Perhaps the surprising thing is that you don't need that many millions to train models with millions of parameters. People would have thought that, would, that was crazy. And it is surprising that you can get away with uh, you know, relatively small amounts of data, even though it's large by the standards of the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, they're also very compute intensive to train and deploy. Um, they're poor at representing uncertainty. And this is something that I'm particularly interested in. Um, there are some great studies that show that neural nets uh, and deep learning systems can be easily fooled by adversarial examples. So you can construct examples that will make the neural network um, very confidently give the wrong answer. And that should be worrying. That relates to the uncertainty thing. It's okay for a system to make mistakes, but it's not okay for it to be really confidently making mistakes because then you don't know when to trust the answers. And you, you can't really build mission-critical systems, things like in, let's say, in the healthcare domain or in self-driving cars and so on, if you really can't trust the confidences of your model. They're finicky to optimize. Um, you know, optimization is non-convex, and there are many different parametric uh, 
architectural choices that need to be made, and they're generally uninterpretable black boxes lacking in transparency and difficult to trust. Okay? Of course, people are working on all of these things, but I wanted to put them on a slide to sort of motivate us to move towards um, the interesting challenges that we have. A particular area that, um, that I'm really interested in, uh, which Phil mentioned in the introduction, is uh, thinking about prob machine learning as probabilistic modeling. So let's go beyond deep learning. I'll come back to neural nets and deep learning in a minute in the context of probabilistic modeling. Let's go beyond deep learning and let's talk about um, a particular view of machine learning that's grounded in the idea that we want systems that will build models from data, probabilistic models from data. So what do I mean by a model? The term model gets used by many people in different contexts. Um, what I mean is uh, a model describes data that one could observe from a system, okay? So uh, it should, model should be able to make predictions, it should, it should say, make statements about observable data. If it doesn't do that, then it's very difficult to know if you have a good model or not, whether you have a falsifiable model, for example, or not. Now, if a model is making statements about possible data, that could be observed, then uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the mathematics of probability theory to express all forms of uncertainty and noise associated with our model. So think about a simple model. Let's take, a, let's say, a model that does uh, forecasting of the weather tomorrow. Okay, that's not a necessarily a simple model. One could certainly build a simple version of that, okay? Now, you don't want models that um, make forecasts that don't tell you um, how uncertain they are. And now you have to consider what are all the different sources of uncertainty they could have in predicting the weather tomorrow. Uh, you might have uncertainty that's coming from the noise in the sensor data that you collected. You might have uncertainty that's coming from the fact that there are unpredictable effects that your model did not consider. Your model might have parameters and you might be uncertain about what the right parameters are. All of those sources of uncertainty we need to deal with somehow. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the language of probability theory to express uncertainty. And to me, that is as fundamental as saying that we use calculus as the language to express rates of change. Probability theory is a language of uncertainty. Then the good news is that we don't have to invoke anything else. We can just stay within this framework of probability theory to uh, infer aspects of the model from data, to adapt our model to data, to make predictions, et cetera. So it all ends up being um, very, very simple. And here's what it looks like. Um, here is uh, Bayes' rule, which is the sort of uh, engine that drives learning from data, um, and I'm color coding things uh, into two classes, uh, data and hypotheses. And what I mean by data is anything that's actually measured, a measured quantity, okay? And what I mean by hypotheses is everything else, okay? The world, from a Bayesian point of view, is divided into two kinds of things, stuff you're measuring and stuff you're not measuring. Okay, and the stuff you're measuring, you've measured, so you kind of know what it is. It could be noisy, but you've measured it. And the stuff you're not measuring, you better represent the fact that you're uncertain about it because you didn't measure it, okay? So um, all of those things we call hypotheses. Okay, so that's not the only thing there. Um, I said that uh, these hypotheses, if we think about these as, as uh, if we're trying to express models of data, we're gonna use probability theory to express our models. So basically for every uh, potential configuration of our hypotheses, we should be able to uh, describe what is the probability of the observed data under that hypothesis. That's the term that's called the likelihood, and that's actually what drives most uh, neural network learning is maximizing likelihood or penalized likelihood of, of some kind. But forget about neural nets now, we're, we're talking much more generally. 
We have this term, which is the likelihood, which gives you the probability of the data given the hypotheses. And then we have this term, which is called the prior. And the prior um, is our representation of our uncertainty about everything we haven't observed um, before we get our data. So be, the game goes like this. Before we have our data, we have to place our bets on all the unobserved things. Uh, we use the language of probability theory to do that. So we put a probability distribution over our space of hypotheses. Then we observe the data. Aha, that's the beautiful moment where we can now uh, compute the likelihood, the probability of the data given the hypotheses. And the simple rules of probability tell you, you multiply these two, you renormalize over all the hypotheses that you've been considering, and then what you get is your new state of knowledge, the posterior distribution over your hypotheses given the data. And that is the prior that you would use if you got any more data. So there's nothing really fundamentally different between the prior and the posterior. It's just the representation of your state of knowledge at any point in the process with the data you've observed so far. OK? Um, so learning and prediction can be seen as forms of inference using this, this rule. And here is um, the slide that I, it's a one slide description of Bayesian machine learning that I always use. Apologies for people who've seen it. But uh, the point is that even Bayes' rule that I had on the previous side is not a fundamental rule. The fundamental rules of probability theory are these two simple rules, the sum rule and the product rule. And the sum rule tells you that the probability of some uh, unknown quantity x is the sum over some other unknown quantity y of the joint probability. So the, the, this is called also sometimes called the marginalization rule. Um, and the product rule says that the joint probability of x and y can be factored into the probability of x times the probability of y given x or the other way around. Okay. So from these two simple rules, if we substitute uh, x and y with data and hypotheses, we can get Bayes' rule, which we got in the previous slide. Um, if we use the following symbols, theta to represent the parameters of our model, d to represent the observed data, and m to represent the, the model class that we've assumed, then we get this expression here, which is just Bayes' rule. Uh, apply to parameters of our model. What would the parameters be? For example, in a neural net, there would be the weights in the neural net. In linear regression, there would be the linear regression coefficients, et cetera. Every model has parameters in this world. OK. Uh, and this is the prior. That's the likelihood. And this term here is the normalizing constant, which is itself quite interesting. It's called the marginal likelihood. Now. This follows from the sum and product rule. If you want to make predictions about any unknown quantity x, given the data, then the sum and product rule tell you that the way you make predictions, there's only one valid way under this framework. And that one valid way is you consider the predictions made by every possible parameter value. So those are these terms. And then you weight them by this uh, term in green, which is the posterior probability of the parameters given the data and the model class. So the act of forecasting or predicting any unknown quantity x given the observed data is, by the sum and product rule, an averaging process. You have to average over all the hypotheses that you've considered. You don't pick the best one or your favorite one or you don't flip a coin or anything like that. You're supposed to average over the space of hypotheses in this particular way. And if you now want to compare different model classes, then um, uh, you might apply uh, Bayes' rule at the level of model classes. And that looks like this, where this term in red, the marginal likelihood, now appears in the numerator rather than the denominator. None of this is actually mysterious. They all follow from, from these two rules. What do I mean by model comparison? Model comparison, um, might, the story might go like this. OK, let's say I'm a biologist. I do an experiment. And I have a colleague. And my colleague says, I believe that um, you know, this transcri transcription factor regulates these genes. And I say, no, I have a different model. I believe that it doesn't and that this one does, or something like that. So my colleague and I have two different models. 
Now, we could argue about it in words, but if we follow this probabilistic framework, what we should do is both of us should write down the model to the uh, specification level that it could make predictions about observable data. It could assign a probability to the observable data. And then um, we observe the data, D, and now we can settle the argument. We basically say, all right, what is the uh, marginal likelihood that, that your model gave to my data? What is the marginal likelihood that my model gives to the data? Well, both of our models had some free parameters. Maybe your model had 17 free parameters, and my model had three free parameters. So my model is simpler somehow. And I want, I don't, now I get nervous. I say, that seems unfair, okay? Oh, your model had more parameters. If, if, if my colleague goes and optimizes those 17 parameters, then sure enough, um, she can fit the data much better than I can, right? But that's not the game. Optimization doesn't follow from the sum rule and the product rule. It doesn't matter that my colleague has 17 parameters and I have three. If we can both compute the marginal likelihood, then we can settle this argument, okay? So I actually really strongly believe that in an ideal world, science would be done like this. People wouldn't just publish their papers in open journals and share their data in an open manner. I think actually people should uh, write down their models in a way that one could evaluate with future data. Maybe write them as probabilistic programs, which I'll talk about later. And then we could really do objective, well, actually it's subjective, but you know, we could do a sort of principled comparison of models given um, different subjective opinions about what the hypotheses are. Okay, so one slide on Bayesian machine learning. So why should we care about all this? We've had a revolution in machine learning with wonderful, fantastic deep learning methods uh, that never talk about Bayes anywhere in them. So why should we care about all this Bayesian stuff? Well, the reason I care is that I, I'd really like models um, with calibrated senses of uncertainty. So I want to be able to trust my system if it says the probability of um, there being a pedestrian in front of my car is 0.1. I want that to mean 10%, and I can take actions that uh, correspond to that calibrated probability. Getting systems that know when they don't know, I feel, is very important. Also, there's a very beautiful thing about all of this, which is that unease about like 17 parameters versus three parameters or different structures of models. Well, this framework actually gives you automatic tools to compare models of different complexity and to automate the learning of models from data. And this is called Bayesian Occam's Razor, and it's something I will um, use in the latter part of my talk. Okay. So, um, let's go back to our neural networks and just to ground the discussion a little bit, um, here's a neural network. It maps from X to Y. Um, there are different sources of uncertainty here. One of them is parameter uncertainty. We have weights in the neural network and uh, you know, given any finite amount of data, we're not sure what those weights should be. So we need to represent our uncertainty. But we also have structural uncertainty. We've made some structural choices, like the architecture, the number of hidden units, a choice of activation functions, and that's also a source of uncertainty. So it would be great if we could uh, represent all of that. And the, um, that's not a new idea. None of this is really new ideas. In fact, the idea of um, doing uh, Bayesian analysis of neural networks has been around since the early 90s, at least, actually late 80s. Um, here's a, a bit of a history of a few different methods. Here is a, a depiction of what we'd really like. So here's a system that was trained to do some regression on some data, and what we'd really like is this sort of behavior, that outside of the range of his training data, it should say, hmm, I don't really know, okay? And there are many ways of doing that. These are all different ways of doing that. And we had a nice workshop at NIPS on Bayesian deep learning um, where uh, we kind of brought that history together and looked at some of the current state of the art. So, this world, uh, machine learning often has camps, and people think that you have to be in one or another camp, but you don't actually. You have to understand 
what all the tools are in the different camps. And there's a lot of fertile ground at the intersection of these camps. And that's, this is one example of those things. So when do we need probabilities? Well, we need them when we, uh, our system, our you know, learning and intelligence problem depends crucially on representing uncertainty. I've sort of said that. But let me describe some examples of that. So anytime we're doing forecasting, OK? And you know, that could be financial forecasting, weather forecasting, forecasting demand at Uber or for Amazon products or whatever. We need to represent our uncertainty. Um, decision making. Generally, when you make decisions, you're thinking about the consequences of your actions into the future. And it's really useful to represent uncertainty there. It's hard to imagine not doing that at some level. When you're learning from limited, noisy, and missing data, so if you imagine um, dealing with, say, medical records, if you're trying to do machine learning and medical records, you have patients, your patients, um, each of them has lots of things that are unobserved. They, maybe there are a few medical tests that have been done on each patient. Most of the data is actually missing if you look at, that, look at it that way. Um, if you want to learn complex personalized models, so it might be, again, whether it's in a medical domain or in a you know, retail domain or something like that, um, you, might have, you might think you have a huge data set, but actually for every uh, patient or every customer, you only have a little bit of data, right? So it's not really a big data problem. You need to represent uncertainty about that individual. The whole field of data compression is based on probabilistic modeling. And a lot of my interest in automatic model discovery and experiment design is really based on um, uh, uncertainty. Now, uh, over the last three months, I've been involved in setting up Uber's AI labs. I'll just mention that in one slide. Why would Uber care about any of this? Well, um, if you look at many of the problems that a large technology company has to solve, uh, they're problems that deal with uncertainty, decision making, uh, personalization, and so on. There are a huge number of problems. There are a huge number of opportunities around any of the major technology companies for learning from data and for using uncertainty in there. And you know, fairly obviously, uh, if you're trying to build a very complicated system that makes decisions in the real world, like a self-driving car, um, you'd really like to have calibrated uncertainties in that system. OK, so here is um, the one slide picture of my current uh, passions, my current uh, research interests. And in the next few minutes, and I'll leave a few minutes for questions at the end, in the next few minutes, I'm going to touch on a few of these topics. Um, and it's fairly modular, so I can stop to give us time for questions. But I wanted to put this slide um, up here because, well, actually, because I had this slide. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's one reason. Because, and the reason I had this slide is that I was asked to give a talk uh, about a year ago, and they told me, uh, summarize your work in one slide. So that forced me to produce this slide. And then when I produced it, I thought, that was actually kind of a useful exercise. So, so the, the useful exercise is that it crystallized in my mind the thing that really drives me. Okay? And you know, it's not that I'm a Bayesian and I just love probabilities or anything like that. It turns out the thing that really drives me is that I like stuff that's automated. Okay? I, don't, I want things to be systematic and automated. And computer scientists are very good at that. Like computer science, if you put your computer science hat on, you do something three times and you think, oh, I need to write a computer program to do that for me. Three times was two times too many, right? Um, and the sorry state of machine learning uh, is that stuff is not really automated. There still is tremendous amounts of human uh, labor, arbitrary decision making, and tweaking involved in deploying machine learning systems, which is ironic. The whole field is about getting systems to learn from data, 
but then there's a, there, there are a lot of well-paid researchers and engineers tweaking those systems that learn from data. So let's think about automating these things. And this is what drives me. So if you look at some of these topics, which I'm going to talk about, so automatic statistician, what is that about? And I'll, I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. That's about automating the process of model discovery from data. So searching for a good model from data. Probabilistic programming, something that Frank Wood, who's at Oxford, uh, is a world expert in. Um, probabilistic programming is automating the process of doing inference from a very general probabilistic model. We also want to automate um, optimization. So optimization is actually a sequential decision problem. If you have an optimizer that's trying to optimize a function, it's making decisions about where to evaluate the function next, uh, collecting some data, and then moving on to another point, and so on. People don't think about optimization that way. They just think about, here's an algorithm, and here's something I can prove about the algorithm. But actually, optimization is, is very much like, you know, uh, Bandit problems, reinforcement learning problems, sequential decision making under uncertainty is something that drives this. We want to optimize, sorry, we want to automate the allocation of computational resources. So especially now that machine learning systems are very complex, right? These, these systems um, use a lot of memory, a lot of CPU. The data sets are very big, so we can't afford to just tinker about and run a few experiments on a single computer. And when we run major experiments, we actually have to worry about the fact that this is running on a big you know, cloud of computers, and you know, that's using uh, energy. And energy costs money, and it's not good for the world, right? using energy like that. So optimizing resource allocation. So these are the things that drive me these days. I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of them very quickly. Probabilistic programming is one of them. Um, the problem here is that uh, developing probabilistic models and deriving inference algorithms is generally a very time-consuming and error-prone process. And the solution um, is to develop probabilistic programming languages. So what are these things? This is a very beautiful marriage between um, probabilistic modeling and programming languages worlds. And the idea is that you have a probabilistic programming language, which is a way of expressing probabilistic models. And the modern ones, the ones that people are very interested in, uh, like Frank Wood and myself these days, are completely general programming languages, sort of Turing-complete programming languages that can express any computable probability distribution. That's the expression part. But what do you do with that? Well, well first of all, how do you do that? You express your model as a simulator, a simulator that would generate data. Okay, that's one canonical way of doing that. And that's a very natural concept. You could say, okay, my, I have a model for the weather. Um, well, that's actually kind of a simulator. Okay? And I write it as a computer program. I have a model for my gene expression network, and that's going to be a simulator that um, you know, simulates gene expression data. Okay? That's the uh, modeling part, but then you have some data. You have a simulator and you have some data, and what you're really interested in is inferring or learning parameters of your simulator, of your model, given the data. And the very incredible thing is that we can actually come up with universal inference engines. We can come up with inference engines that, in principle, um, could compute the probability distribution over the hidden variables in our computer program given the data. So it's basically running Bayes' rule on computer programs. We're all used to running computer programs in the forward direction. You take some inputs and you produce some outputs. But this is kind of doing it backwards. You have a computer program that takes some inputs and some calls to random number generators and produces some outputs. These are random outputs. That's the data. And now we say, well, what should the inputs and the calls to the random number generators have been to observe this output for the computer program? That's Bayes' rule on the program. And there are many languages 
Now Anglican is the one that uh, Frank Wood's team has been developing, one of the state-of-the-art languages. Our um, group in Cambridge has a language called Turing, which is much less developed, but also exciting. It's based on Julia. Um, and there are many different languages developed by different groups, and there are many different inference uh, algorithms that can generally run on models in those languages. Here is, for example, a hidden Markov model written in, um, in Turing. Um, it's fairly easy to read. If you uncomment one line of this model, you go from a regular hidden Markov model to a Bayesian hidden Markov model. So changing models around is as easy as sort of adding and removing a few lines of uh, your probabilistic program. Um, and I really think that you know, if our vision actually plays out, this could really revolutionize scientific modeling. If people were actually willing to write probabilistic programs for all of their models and they shared them, then people could take somebody else's model, run it on their data, improve it, et cetera. A few resources here. I'll just give you a few examples. These are now slides from uh, my postdoc, Hong K. Okay. Um, it's a little bit about Turing. I'll skip through that. That's our HMM example, but much bigger. This is a Bayesian neural network. Most of this is specifying the prior on the, on the weights. Um, and then this is the actual you know, Bayesian neural network. That's just sort of the neural network function and so on. And then you could just run inference using you know, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or something. You don't have to even know what that is. Uh, it abstracts away the model specification from the inference. Um, and our language Turing is pretty um, competitive. It's, it's sort of in the same ballpark as Anglican, occasionally a bit faster. Um, but I know that the Anglican team keeps improving their language as well. Um, another topic I want to talk about is Bayesian optimization. I have a, basically a couple slides on that. So uh, the problem here is you want to find ideally a global optimum. Maybe that's too much to ask of some black box function that is expensive to evaluate. So you can't just evaluate in lots and lots of places. You need to think about where you're going to evaluate your function next. And we don't want to do that manually. We want to automate the algorithm that thinks about that. So the solution is to treat the problem as sequential decision making um, uh, under uncertainty. And what we're uncertain about is what the actual function is. And this has a huge number of applications. And I'm actually, you know, I'll say a couple words about the automatic statistician, but I do want to leave some time for questions. So um, the automatic statistician is automating, is trying to automate model discovery. And the idea here is uh, what we'd like is a system where we can just give it data. It searches over a large space of models, evaluating models according to some principled metric that trades off model complexity with the amount of data that you have, and actually the marginal likelihood, which I described, is, is one such metric. It produces a model, and then interestingly, it translates that into a report that is then interpretable by a human being. So this is the opposite of a black box. We really want a transparent box, something that the human will be able to understand. Okay? And uh, again, I, you know, I'll actually skip over most of this because I do want to leave time for questions. So we do a search over models. This is the automatic statistician applied to some time series. It finds a good model. Then it, it comes up with a description of that model. It produces the text itself. So this is the executive summary of the text. Actually, the text is in the form of these documents, which are you know, um, five to 10 pages long. And you know, we can have, here is the report writing demo. I, you know, we could run this and this is a, a slightly different version of this, which actually does clustering. Uh, it tries to visualize things. It tells you what it's found, et cetera. OK? Um, and it tends to perform well at prediction because actually being systematic pays off. OK, and we've applied this to classification as well to regression, to clustering, and so on. And we're going to have a release of it, I keep saying, very soon. But this time, I really mean it. Very soon means in a couple of months. OK. So uh, I'm going to wrap up there. Um, 
this probabilistic modeling framework isn't the only way to do machine learning, but it's, it's a really useful organizing principle. There, is, um, there are many layers, and it's completely compatible with the choice of models that you have, and whether you like <clears throat> deep learning, or even logic, and other frameworks, and so on. We, we really can hybridize a lot of these methods to produce uh, interesting systems that reason about uncertainty and learn from data. I've briefly reviewed three topics. This is a review paper I wrote uh, a couple of years ago that summarized this uh, line of work. And I wanted to end by thanking a whole bunch of collaborators I've had. Okay. your hand up if you have a question. No problem. Hi, um, I come from an activist background of technology. I was wondering, what, so when you mentioned Bayesian modeling, one thing you always want to specify are the primes. So, you know, in terms of, you know, non-parametrics, how do you, you know, envision priors in this modeling? Right. So the question is, um, how, how do we come up with the priors, basically? Right? I think this is a great question. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that actually there's no difference between the prior and the rest of the model. Basically, uh, in my world, there's only two things. There's data and there's the model. Um, the model, you know, basically in a lot of statistics, people say the likelihood is given. But where did, who came up with the likelihood? <laughs> the likelihood makes assumptions, and the prior makes assumptions. In fact, if you don't make any assumptions, all you have is the data. The only thing you can say is, that was my data, <laughs> right? So all modeling makes assumptions, and um, when we specify a model that is fully specified, including the likelihood and the prior and so on, then the nice thing about a fully specified model is that from that model, we can actually um, evaluate the probability of data. If I don't specify the model, I can't do the, the, the prior, I can't do that. Let me give you a very concrete example. Okay. The simplest model in the world in statistics is linear regression. Okay, here is a linear regression. If I tell you my, the relationship between X and Y is a linear regression, to me, that's not a well-specified model because there is a huge difference between linear regression where I assume the slope can go between plus and minus one and linear regression where I assume the slope can go between plus and minus a thousand, okay? Those are two different models. The prior is just a way of uh, describing the sensible range that parameters can have in your model. The same holds for any modeling uh, problem that you encounter. If you look closely, it makes some assumptions, there's some parameters, you have to say what are sensible ranges for those parameters. Different choices correspond to different models. Okay. Um, so the question was, to what extent is causality important and how do you model that? Um, I haven't actually talked much about causality. I've worked a little bit on causality, mostly with colleagues who know more about it than I do. Um, causality is hugely important in the sense that if we want to understand our world and to act in it, it's not good enough to figure out that things are correlated. We need to know what will be the consequences of manipulating um, one variable on other variables. And uh, time is a great indicator for causality because you know, we know that causality can't go backwards in time. But if you just have observational data, it is quite difficult to figure out what the causal relationships are, whether x caused y or y caused x. Now, when I say it's quite difficult, it, Actually, people were too negative about it. They just thought it's impossible. Because if you don't make any assumptions, it is impossible. But if you start making some assumptions, recent work by people like, for example, Bernard Sholkoff um, in a kind of more classical setting, and 
others in a more Bayesian setting, have shown that if you just start making some sensible assumptions, then you can actually tell with some certainty whether x caused y or y caused x or whether there was a hidden common cause. So there is a lot of recent advances in causality, and it's a very exciting area. It's hugely, hugely important. Uh, here, yeah, it's right behind you. No, yeah, I'll take that question. Um, to me, it seems a bit like a lot of brute engineering. Do you think there's a unifying learning theory? Um, I'm surprised, because to me it seems like a very unified learning theory. Um, uh, so what's the, the engineering aspect of it? The choice of prior? Or? By the fact that all these different components which are disjoint. Okay. If, you look, if you look at your, sort of your, 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 the, the slide you had on what ties all of this together and your interests. Ah, uh, right, my interests, the sort of the yellow slide, yeah? Okay, so yeah, let's come back to this. Um, there, uh, it's fair to say there isn't a unifying theory here, okay? In the sense that um, this is a, this is a, a desire. Our, our desire is to make stuff more automatic. But if you look at um, the way in which we solve particular problems, let's say that we try to solve the problem of discovering a model from data, or we try to solve the problem of optimizing um, a function that is expensive to evaluate, then, uh, at, or this problem of doing inference on a probabilistic program, then actually for each one of those problems, there is a very clearly defined normative thing to do. There is the ideal that you want to achieve, okay? You can write down what the ideal is. You have some principles. You have principles based on Bayes' rule, and you have principles based on Bellman's equation, sort of other basic principles that you can invoke. There is an ideal thing that you want to solve, but the bad news is that the ideal thing is generally computationally intractable. Okay, so you need to make some uh, approximations to be able to solve it. So. Uh, so I think that the biggest kind of conceptual challenge in this whole framework is we can't do our ideal thing because it's too expensive computationally. Um, and so we need to understand. But could it be computationally expensive because it's not actually fundamentally understood? OK, what well, it's understood in a world where computation is free. It's understood what the ideal answer is in a world where computation is free. In a world where you have limited resources, that's this sort of uh, bubble here, when you, in a world where you have bounded resources, this relates to the, the sort of um, ideas of bounded rationality, then, then it becomes fiendishly difficult to figure out how do you try to do the rational thing within um, you know, computational uh, time and memory and so on constraints. And the problem with that is to figure out what the optimal thing is in that setting, you have to use resources. So you're sort of kind of living in a box where you have to figure out how to use resources to figure out how to use the rest of your resources. So, yeah, that is difficult. Um, I think we might need to, uh, maybe one last question here and then yeah. just a quick one. Uh, you mentioned deep learning models as a sort of black box which we can't Uh, what's the most promising way in which we might be able to take the sort of models that we have right now and understand them? There's, there is a lot of fantastic work trying to understand deep learning models. I know, for example, DeepMind has a great interest in, in developing, in a sense, visualization tools for what's happening inside our, our deep learning models. Um, so one approach is trying to visualize what's going on, but I actually think that that's really difficult because these systems have so many parameters, you might visualize a little bit of it, but not know what the system as a whole is doing. I'm uh, sort of more interested in 
uh, understanding the input-output behavior, the properties of the input-output behavior of these systems. Um, and, and so uh, tools for figuring out the uncertainty in the input-output behavior are the level at which I think you can, you can actually understand these things. So, so Better that, tools for representing uncertainty. So that's roughly that uh, you build, uh, you analyze the model after you've built it, rather than uh, building it in a different way originally. Yeah, there, there is a whole strand of work that we're involved in on transparency and interpretability of models, where there are two approaches, essentially, at a very high level. You either build a model that's interpretable in the first place, like a, decision a shallow decision tree or something like that, or you build a complicated model, and then you build an interpretation system that tries to interpret what the complicated model is doing. So there's sort of two ways of doing things. But okay, I think we'll, we better wrap it up there, but um, let's thank Susan again.